Hi class, it's week three now of group and I am trying out my new blue light glasses. So I don't know. I'm sorry if you think like I look foolish, but I'm staring in front of a computer for hours on end working. And so I decided to try something out to see if it helps with all the staring at the computer. Um, anyways, um, this week we are talking about um, the advanced group. Um, you had chapters 11 and 12, I believe, with Yalom. And um, so I'm just covering the main points of chapter 12. Um, and you saw that in week three in the learning activities. It talks about that. So some of the main points of uh, chapter 12 is subgrouping, conflict and therapy, self-disclosure, and termination. Um, these are all parts of a group, obviously. Now, there are going to be groups, and I'll highlight this a little bit more, but there are going to be groups where there isn't necessarily a set to, like termination. Like when you think of an AA group, an NA group, um, some sort of process groups, um, there is no ter termination because there's no beginning and end. Anyone can come at any time. There are other groups where it's very regimented and more strict and there is a process in the group and so therefore there is a beginning and an end. Um, and so therefore determination is really important. So when we talk about subgrouping, um, this is something that it, it that happens in groups, right? We, we recognize it with our friends. Um, it's something that happens in families sometimes. Um, we see it happen very normally around children when we watch them at recess. Um, but this is something that can affect cohesion of a group, can affect group dynamics. Um, sometimes people get together and it creates a toxic situation. Um, it can be used in a positive way, but if not handled and addressed and not ringing in the people to be part of the group, the group and the cohesion, it can cause a lot of deviation and separation. You can probably think back to times in your life in group settings when people pair off or um, like, you know, it's a group of 10 people and you got a little group of three here and a little group of two there. And, you know, maybe the groups don't like each other. And then when the group comes together, it get, becomes very problematic. We as humans, we do those kinds of things. Um, we even see this in biblical situations where. You know, there's a group of people, I think of Moses with the Israelites, and, you know, he, he looks at his leaders and he asks them to go do something, and then they come back and they say, we can't win, you know, and then um, we can't go over to there, we can't win, and uh, Joshua's like, we can do it, we can do it, we can, we can go over there, we're going to get our promised land, and, you know, as a result, they end up wandering for 40 years, you know, so there's a lot of different examples, even biblically, of like a group of people not doing things cohesively and they're being subgrouping and then, you know, there's deterioration. Um, so sometimes it can be a reflection of things not going well in the group. Um, maybe it's things not being addressed that need to be addressed. Honesty is it now there could be people in the group, like for lack of a better term, that can be really annoying, right? Like the oversharers, the over talkers, like, Oh, they're talking again, kind of thing. We've probably experienced that in groups that we've been in. However, um, sometimes like the, the little clickiness happens because maybe people are annoyed or frustrated, things of that nature, but that doesn't mean that, that that's okay. But it's like, how do we address that? Where, how do we, as the group leader address that, take care of that? Um, maybe call it out in a very kind way. When a therapist, when the group leader is mindful of the subgrouping, um, it can help the person maybe when, when they do address it, it could help address a personal issue. Um, it could bring the problem and help the group work through the problem together. Um, it can help the subgroup join the group, you know, like maybe when attention is drawn to it, it could make them realize, oh, you know what, we're being kind of inclusive instead of, instead of ex or we're being kind of exclusive instead of inclusive. We need to be more inclusive. We need to include everyone. We need, we need, you know, um, we need to make sure that we are part of this group and not just our own little group. Um, sometimes people feel safer maybe with one person. And so they really click with that person. They have good chemistry. That's okay. That's going to happen. But it's like, again, are we isolating ourselves from the group, you know, and there's usually group roles and group norms that shouldn't be allowing those kinds of situations to happen, even though they very easily could happen. And so as a group leader, we need to be mindful of those things. We need to see the culture, the climate of the group and know how to address it. And, and hopefully um, use it as a learning tool to, to grow group members um, 
and, and not just create de deterioration in the group because that's one way for people to not to not feel safe now working with any group of people there is going to be conflict right we have conflict in our homes we have conflict at work we have conflict in churches we have conflict all over the place right um it's just part of life so if you didn't know that <laughs> now you do not to mention you're gonna be making money off people's conflict <laughs> um that's just a little joke there so anyways dealing with conflict um is part of life and some people deal with conflict really well some people don't some people are very confrontational some people are very avoidant um and so it's learning how you know you can work with group members and help develop them to mature and grow through conflict um conflict doesn't have to be negative you know it can be really positive um, it can be a way to, for people to grow and to mature, um, and it can be dealt with in a really good way, but it can be dealt with not well. Um, it can create hostility because people get very defensive, right? Um, as we talked about before, like what could be, there could be things that are going on for a person individually. Maybe they're reminded of their past. Um, someone in the group, um, reminds them of their mother, their father, their sibling, an ex-boyfriend, girlfriend, thing of that nature. Um, their child who they have a lot of hostility towards. So there can be all these underlining things. So then when someone confronts them on something that like you could see a side of them that you haven't seen before, um, you know, because again, you remind me of someone. So even though you're saying that and you're not that person, I'm projecting those feelings on you. And projection can be very problematic because you're projecting on somebody else, your own feelings when that has nothing to do with that person. And if you're not aware of that, um, then you can't change that. And so that can be a place of like, you know, a therapist pointing that out, like, well, you know, so-and-so has never done that. So where is this coming from? Um, it sounds like that's kind of how you feel about yourself. Um, and so making sure even when someone's confronting someone about an issue, is that even really the issue at hand? Is it really even that person's issue? Is it maybe more your issue? You know? Um, and I see projection all the time here in private practice. Like, I pointed out often my clients, it sounds like they were really projecting what they're feeling, not so much what you were doing. And they're like, absolutely, that's what was happening. Um, it happens quite often. It's not necessarily intentional at all from the person that is projecting. Um, I think it's just a lack of self-awareness of that person to not realize what they're doing. Um, you know, defensiveness and conflict could cause rivalry. Well, um, now I'm against you because you did this to me. Um, it could cause like, you think you're better than everybody else because you're this or you're that. Um, and then that's where like treating group members all the same is really important. Not showing you favoritism, really just making sure everyone feels comfortable, um, in the scene as equal. So then there's less room for rivalry. Um, I know with even siblings, right. And parents, parents really try to not create rivalry between like a, a competition between kids. Sometimes that's just in their nature. Some kids just want to make everything a competition, even though it's not. And that's just some of their personality, but trying to create this place, like, I love you all the same, regardless of what you bring to the table. I love you all the same. Um, someone else is going to make something of it, you know? And so trying to address those things as they come up is really important for a group leader. Um, running a group is not as simple as it may look, you know, um, there's a lot, it's an art, it's an art, really good group leaders are really good at controlling the group. Um, not in a way that's like authoritarian, but just having, um, making a way of making it very cohesive, working together, um, addressing things appropriately, um, you know, and, and it's really an art form. It really truly is. It's not like just winging it, you know, and I know when you first do it, it may feel like that a little bit because it's, it's new. And that's where, again, later we're going to talk about co-leaders. That's why it's maybe important to have maybe a more experienced co-leader where they can kind of guide you through the ropes of it all. Um, but it is something like that does take work and growth and, um, is very different than working with an individual client, managing hostility. Um, you know, you as a, as the leader want to show empathy, um, trying to show that you really care about the person's feelings. Um, you really hope for it to be different for them. Um, you really empathize for them. Um, trying to be clear, um, in how you're conveying negative feedback. Um, and two, you being able to receive negative feedback. If you're giving negative feedback, um, or criticism, constructive criticism, you want to be a person that's willing to receive it. 
And that is sometimes really hard. Like we can give it, but we can't receive it. And in a group setting, you need to be willing to receive it. And sometimes the feedback you may get is really helpful and you don't notice that about yourself or you don't see things in yourself because we aren't perfect and we're human and we're, we have our own issues and our own sensitivities and our own hot topics for ourselves. And so we don't know when somebody may get that out of us just because we are capable of like responding to something even though we don't want to. And so someone else addressing that with us could be really um, helpful and, and help us to grow as clinicians. And that's what we need to be open to. I mean, of course, we want it to be done in a, an appropriate way. Um, and if it's not, that's where too, we can use that as a learning, an, a learning opportunity in the group. Self-disclosure. We talked about this a little bit last time. Um, there's a risk with it, right? Like, I mean, you're opening up some vulnerability, your, um, clients are seeing something about you, but, um, it can be really helpful. Um, you don't want to share too much. You don't want to share too little. It's trying to find what's the balance, what's appropriate. Um, you know, self-disclosure is important for the group as a whole, because a lot of times it requires people to open up. And if people don't want to talk, then it makes it really hard. And so in your group, if you have an overshare, that can be obnoxious. And then if you have someone that doesn't contribute at all, that can be frustrating. And I know even in groups I've been in, it's like, you know, you no one ever wants to be the oversharer because it's annoying. Um, but some people are just really aren't mindful or they really can't handle silence. And so with that, they have a really hard time waiting for people to speak up. And so they always feel like they need to fill that, that silence. And so it becomes problematic because that person's dominating the group, you know, and, um, that really may cause other people to not want to share because you're like, well, so-and-so always share. So whatever, you know. But when people all take turns sharing or do share, it creates this environment where people will want to share more, you know, um, it opens the door for vulnerability, you know, and, um, hopefully conveying it's a safe place. Let's talk about it. Let's, and as people hopefully see growth and change in their lives, then that promotes even more. Like, I just want to get, I just want to get this out so I can get better. You know, um, these people relate to me, they understand me and that helps me. Um, and so there is, there is huge potential for positive strides if self-disclosure is done correctly. Um, and we can model that with our own personal self-disclosure, but also to like really encouraging the group to self-disclose even in individual counseling. I'll tell my clients, you know, um, this is, you're going to get as much out of this as what you put into it, you know? And if you're not honest with me, um, it serves you no point. Cause I'm not going to know if you're not being honest and I, and, you know, granted, you know, that doesn't matter to me. If you want to sit here and tell tall tales, that's on you, but you're not going to get anything out of this, you know? Um, and I'm just very straightforward in that way. Cause it's the truth. Like, I mean, sure. I sit here, I listen to you. Um, but is that really helping you if you're just sitting here and not being honest or forthcoming, you know? And the whole point of a group usually is for a purpose. Like you're not going to get anything from the group if you're not participating in the group. Now, where we have to own it is if the group doesn't feel safe and that's where we need to maybe change some group dynamics so it feels safe. But that's also on the person if they're not willing to share that they don't feel safe, um, that they feel uncomfortable to share, blah, 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 vice versa, right? Termination. Now, termination can feel like abandonment for some people, but that's why there's a process to termination, you know, especially with a group where it's like, this is eight sessions, like, you know, it's coming, right? It's part of the process. So, you know, just making sure that you're pre prepping your clients for termination, um, knowing, um, knowing that they are, they're ready for it. Um, they're looking to it. Um, you know, it's something hopefully like you've been talking about this whole time. Um, group can, in group termination can look very different. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of different kinds of groups. Sometimes like if you're in an inpatient setting, um, you're going to be part of a group until you're ready to go. And so there might be some sort of like, I don't know, ceremony or, um, experience that kind of helps a person know like it's their time or there's some level of they're ready that, that they, they've shown. And so, you know, they have some sort of like big end group meeting that encourages that person and validates that person. I think it's also letting them know that support is here regardless if they're in the group or not. 
any longer that they can either come back to the group or come back to a facility. They can come back to therapy, like that the group never goes away. You know, those, there's there can be those kinds of options and other options. It would be like, you know, if you ever need us again, look back to these tools, look back to these things that we've done, um, things of that nature. So, you know, wherever you end up facilitating group, you really need to understand all the different processes and expectations and even what is what is this look like if there's relapse or what does this look like um, if the person starts feeling really depressed or really anxious again um, are they allowed to just come back and make sure you're clear and understand those things so that you can clearly communicate that to your clients because I think that is so important um, part like when we look at a recovery model part of recovery is relapse. And so although nobody who's been in recovery wants to relapse, there's a strong potential of that happening. And so even how you can prep, you know, family, prep your client for those things is important and knowing what resources will still be here regardless of what ends up happening. Um, so just making sure you educate yourself and really understand the model um, that your facility is working under so that you, again, can better support and communicate and be clear with your group. I think communication is huge in group, making sure you have a clear understanding, your group members have a clear understanding of what's going on and what's expected of them. And I think with that, everything will run 100 times smoother. Um, I hope you found this information helpful. Again, this is week three. We're moving right along here. This goes by so fast. Um, and I look forward to chatting with you again next week.